Greetings YouTubers and welcome to today's episode of Lies Flurfs Tell. Today's lie is Tsunamis don't travel around Antarctica. Now I don't know who came up with this particular piece of nonsense, but it seems especially popular amongst the more credulous and uncritical of Witsit's disciples, who show no perceptible hesitation in publicly humiliating themselves by repeating this tripe. So in this video I'm going to explain the three critical errors that they have made. Error 1. As a general rule, when you are trying to make an argument, do not directly reference observational data that contradicts you. This is obviously easier said than done if your argument is that the Earth is flat because reality says otherwise. Nonetheless, a little effort along these lines will stop you looking quite as foolish. Obviously, it's far too much to expect that flat earthers fully detail their claim, but based on the graphic they repeatedly show in relation to this discussion, the event they are considering is the magnitude 8.8 .8 Chilean earthquake of February 27, 2010, and its associated tsunami. Prior to this event, the international scientific community had come to the conclusion that it might be a good idea if there were early warning systems for tsunamis. As a result, a network of ocean bottom pressure sensors was put in place to track tsunami propagation. Now, had Witsit or any of his fawning cult members been bothered to engage with observational data, they could have downloaded the data from these ocean bottom pressure sensors and they could have plotted them up like this. On the left, we have an azimuthal equidistant projection focused on the epicenter of the earthquake, showing the positions of the pressure sensors as small red squares. On the right, we see the time series for the circled pressure sensor. The earthquake epicenter is marked with a red star. And had our flat earth friends been so inclined, they could have plotted this out through time, showing the tsunami propagating away from the tsunamigenic event and reaching each sensor in order of increasing distance from the epicenter. There are some subtleties with this, as tsunamis propagate slower through shallower water, but in general the pattern remains. The tsunami reaches closer sensors earlier and more distant sensors later. Exactly what we should expect. But of course, being flat earthers, they would have done this exercise on a flat earth map. But luckily for them, they don't need to. I've done it for them. And had they done this simple check, they would have noticed that the tsunami propagation on the flat earth map is not simple and intuitive. The tsunami does not hit the closer sensors first. It magically transports to very remote sensors traveling at speeds of up to 1,800 kilometers an hour in order to make the journey in the allowed time, which is more than twice as fast as the maximum possible velocity for a tsunami. So to the surprise of absolutely no one, tsunami propagation data are utterly inconsistent with a flat earth geometry, which does rather beg the question of why they keep on harping on about this subject quite so much. My second tip for aspiring wits at sycophants is, if you're going to come up with a hypothesis that you want to test, try to make sure that your expected result is not in fact physically impossible. Based once again on the graphics that they provide, this is apparently the propagation pattern they expect to have seen for the 2010 Chilean tsunami. Apparently, their model of physical reality is that billions of tons of water will veer left and right like a coke-addled Formula One driver. Needless to say, reality is rather different. The further the tsunami travels, the longer the tsunami wavefront, the more diffuse the energy of the event becomes. Additionally, some energy will be lost to turbulence, friction, heat, and other effects. In this particular instance, the coastlines of Patagonia and Antarctica act as something of a waveguide, reflecting any energy that bounces against them and stopping the energy from dissipating quite as rapidly. Since every point on the wavefront is a source for a radially propagating wave, as soon as the wavefront passes the coastline and is no longer restrained, some of the wavefront's energy will be propagated at an angle to the direction of travel of the wave up till that point but that diverging wavefront will be less energetic than the primary wavefront. Okay, so that left-hand curve is misleading and grotesquely physically inaccurate, but at least some of the wavefront energy will get to that arrow. What about this right-hand curve? How physically plausible is that? 
Once again, we invoke Huygens' principle and we see that as the main wavefront passes Drake's passage, at least some of the wavefront energy will be propagated eastward. But given the large angle between these two wave paths, the amount of energy thus propagated will be very small. Having passed through Drake's passage, the divergent wave front's length increases rapidly, further diminishing the wave's energy. And by now the pattern should be obvious. The largely dissipated wave front's energy is further reduced as it propagates past the Weddell Sea embayment and then sends a second divergent wave front down the coast of Droning Maudland. It should come as no surprise that the Flat Earth model of how the 2010 tsunami should have propagated turns out to be physically impossible. Who could have suspected that slapping a curve on a map and saying that looks okay to me is not in fact a substitute for properly modelling the system? So Flat Earthers are correct to observe that the 2010 tsunami did not propagate around Antarctica. They are, however, completely incorrect in asserting that it should have. If Flat Earthers were really interested, what they could have done is constructed a fully physical model of the event, and then compared their model results versus observational data for arrival times and amplitude. Having validated their model, they could then present the results using a sophisticated graphics package. Or they could do a web search to see if anybody has been kind enough to do all that work for them. Being the experts in research that they so obviously are, they would have had no difficulty finding these resources. They could then, if they were so inclined, move on to find a plot of the tsunami energy as a function of position. Had they done so, they would have seen instantly that as it passes through the Drake's Passage, the amplitude of tsunami is less than 1% of its maximum amplitude. Or you could just eyeball a couple of curves on a map and be done with it. I mean, screw it. Who's going to notice? My third tip for Flat Earthers is if you are going to make a claim, at least check whether or not it can be instantly falsified. For instance, if you want to claim that no tsunami has travelled around Antarctica, not one, not ever, then you might want to do a quick, preemptive Google search, just to make sure that no one with a keypad can instantly falsify your claim. I mean, if you'd made a big deal about making a claim like that, and it turned out that there actually was a tsunami that propagated all the way around Antarctica, that would be pretty embarrassing. I mean, you'd look like a complete fool. Any sane person would obviously check whether or not that was true before they went online and made that claim. Any flat earther that has working hands could have made that Google search, but it's blindingly obvious none of them did. Because if they had, they would have found what I found, the South Sandwich Island tsunami of August the 12th, 2021. Here we're going to consider a sequence of plots of the propagation of the tsunami with the one-hour isochrons highlighted in red. We're mostly interested in the eastward and westward propagation of the tsunami. As the time series progresses, we can see the eastern and western wavefronts converging on western and eastern Australia respectively until the two wavefronts collide at a point south-southwest of New Zealand. At around 12 hours after the triggering event, it's worth noting that at the point in time where the wavefronts collide, the northern wavefront is nowhere near the North Pole. This directly contradicts a flat Earth geometry, which requires that the distance around Antarctica is more than three times the distance from the tsunami focus to the North Pole. So there are three takeaways from today's video. 1. Tsunami propagation is completely consistent with a spherical geometry, but utterly inconsistent with a planar geometry. 2. The proposed tsunami propagation patterns that Flat Earthers claim they should see are completely unphysical. Drawing curves on a map is not a substitute for physical modelling. And three, and perhaps most centrally, there are tsunamis that travel around Antarctica. They're not common, but to claim that there aren't any is simply false. So I might leave it there for today. Thank you very much for watching. I really do appreciate it, and I hope you'll join me next time.